have three presentations left. And we'll have discussion after, I think, presentation both after school official IUL and Yamana's case, so that the, both the uh, secondary IULs we can discuss together. Yes, Dr. Alexander. Excellent. So thank you. Thank you so much for the organized, uh, to the organizers for allowing uh, ASRS to participate. And thank you for all, everybody on this panel. I've learned a lot from each one of you each, each time I hear you present. So um, I'm going to talk about scleros sutured IOLs, and we also prepared a couple of cases um, of both uh, scleros sutured IOLs and Yamani technique to kind of force the discussion. And I call it eight ways to avoid complications. These are my disclosures, which are not pertinent to this presentation. And I think pearl number one, you really need to know what's inside that eye because a lot of time as retina specialists, we're taking things out that we didn't put in. And in this case, um, uh, we discovered that this patient actually had a superior uh, tunnel. And um, uh, as we are uh, performing the surgery, we have to think, okay, if there is a tunnel, that's probably a PMMA lens. We weren't able to get records for this patient. And uh, we wanted to avoid that tunnel, but yet we needed to make sure we put our sclerotomies for the vitrectomy. And we did a, ended up doing a temporal tunnel as opposed to superior tunnel, which is my usual approach. Also, you have to be aware if there is a very, sometimes the remaining cortic, cortex is very, very hard and difficult to remove even with vitrectomy and act like intraocular foreign body. And Dr. Chi would be comfortable with that, of course. And uh, the other thing is, um, if you have a capsular tension ring, you have to be very aware of that. This is my usual technique. If it's a, a acrylic lens, I uh, bring it up with um, a soft tip, and then I uh, use uh, my forceps and using using Kuglin hook. I feel like very atraumatically, you're able to bring it into the anterior chamber, and then you can uh, make a small uh, scleral, uh, sorry, corneal incision at this point, self sealing corneal incision and remove it after you cut this lens. So knowing what's inside, I think is extremely important as you plan your surgery. And then you have to decide what you're going to put inside. And, um, you know, obviously, if there's something to rescue that's inside, you can rescue that. But these are our options when it comes to scleral fixated IOLs. Uh, we have CZ70BD that has been around for a very long time. It's a PMMA lens. It's quite large. And I think it has fallen mostly out of favor because of the uh, big incision that you need to make to get the lens into the eye. So we have uh, AO60 or Acreos and MX60 or Invista, which uh, were not um, designed for scleral fixation, but we as retina specialists have been utilizing them pretty extensively using the Gore-Tex sutures most commonly to secure them to the sclera. And um, AO60 does allow for uh, four-point fixation and MX60 uh, allows as well kind of four point, four point fixation if you use it in a hammock uh, approach. So I think it's very important to measure twice and cut once when it comes to the surgeries. I usually mark before I create my pyridomies, before I put any trocars in, uh, so I know that I'm centered. And there's a lot of discussion how far back and how far apart you go. And I've modified over years and started going a little bit more further back and I go five in between, and I think it allows for a nice location of the lens. Uh, this is a, um, a kind of a warning tale not to pull too hard on the sutures as you put the lens into the eye. This is in Vista, which is probably more prone to this than Acreos. And you can see as um, the fellow is putting the implant in, I was the one pulling on the Gore-Tex. And uh, we can see how the Gore-Tex just uh, cut that eyelet and uh, we had to remove this lens and to place another lens into the eye. And we've published uh, along with uh, several co colleagues across um, US on these um, uh, eyelid fractures. And uh, a, a report was a total of 25 scleral sutured and vista MX60 lenses uh, that uh, were dis displaced secondary to eyelid fractures and five were sustained in the uh, were noticed during the surgery, which was one of ours, uh, but 20 were noticed uh, post-operatively. And the question becomes, was there something intraoperatively then why could one could notice that might have led to post-operative uh, fracture of the eyelid? So something to be aware uh, in this particular lenses. And another tip uh, number four is to leave ends long till the end. So this is um, how we 
uh, tie it three, one, one. And then uh, before I cut, I do rotate them just a little bit uh, to get them ready in the position as I'm gonna bury them. And the reason uh, I found this useful, I was operating, I operate a lot with the fellows and uh, it was a great fellow, but sometimes when you're watching somebody else do it, it's very hard to judge what the tension is on that, uh, on that lens. And so as we rotated, I realized that the suture was quite loose. And uh, this was the one time I had to untie the Gore-Tex and it's much easier. You can untie it and retie it, but it's much easier to do, obviously, if you have longer ends still remaining. So um, I leave the ends long and then just move it to make sure I like the position of the lens, everything looks good. And then I cut the suture. Uh, there's been a lot of debate whether PI is necessary and uh, there's been several reports of um, pupillary block uh, with uh, different types of lenses. I find that um, doing a small peripheral inferior PI is uh, not problematic for the patients. I don't make large PIs. I don't make them at uh, nine or three o'clock to avoid glare. And I haven't had any patient complain, but I personally do put a PI and I'd be curious if anybody on the panel does as well. And hypotony is an important uh, uh, consideration in these cases because you, I, I don't suture these lenses. I do these cases 25 gauge. So it's pretty small sclerotomy, but at the same time, um, you know, you can uh, have some uh, oozing at the end of the case. So I tend to rotate the knot. You wanted to rotate the knot in general to avoid any uh, delayed um, exposure of the knot and conjunctival uh, issues. And then as I rotate the knot into the a wound that was uh, the trocar wound, um, then we pull back a little bit and it essentially kind of closes it from the inside. I think also very important to uh, prevent hypotony is to make sure that when you create your initial pyridomy, you're aware of both conjunctival and tenons. I think as retina specialists, we don't have a lot of respect sometimes for conjunctiva. And I've learned uh, doing uh, some of the PDS cases kind of to respect the conjunctiva and tenons a little bit more. And I'm very aware where my tenons and where my conj are. And when I close, now when I close the pyridomy, I make sure that I close the tenons over that suture. And I think it prevents long-term health uh, of, the, uh, of the eye and prevents erosion. And uh, of course, if you're using AO60, there has been uh, multiple reports of uh, opacification on air or gas usage. It's interesting because it doesn't happen every time. And uh, I think if you, if you have an eye that's complex and you might think that they might need air or gas down the road, uh, you might wanna pause and think which lens you're gonna use as your secondary IOL. And uh, uh, I presented a case actually yesterday in more detail, but it's important to remember that the sutures that we place are still foreign bodies. This is a gentleman who had um, intraocular foreign body trauma. We removed the cataract, removed the foreign body, uh, did vitrectomy. Uh, several months later, we implanted the secondary eye well. He had this uh, air of pigmentation that was initially thought to be like a speck of dust. The, the patient is a mechanic. It was cultured in the office with negative culture. And then during the surgery, because he kept getting conjunctival erosion, we noticed this skip lesions. And um, upon culture, uh, this patient actually grew curvularia, which is black mold. And um, this patient is a fascinating case because the patient uh, was a year out from his initial surgery. He was 2020 with that secondary lens and no evidence of any endoplomitis or any cell at all in the eye. Uh, but he did have this curvularia growing on the cortex suture. So in summary, I think, uh, uh, points to keep in mind uh, when you operate, whether you use scleral IOLs, some of these apply obviously for any secondary IOL, do know what's inside because you need to uh, really plan your wounds. Uh, you need to plan how you're gonna get things out. If it's a PMMA lens and you can't cut it, you need a larger wound. Also uh, knowing uh, if you have um, capsular tension ring and sometimes you know that capsular tension ring might be sutured 
Uh, it's great to get op reports, but which it's not always possible if it was done a long time ago or at another hospital. Measure a twice cut once, that applies to any surgery we do. Do not pull too hard, and especially uh, with AO6, uh, with Invista lenses, sorry, you need, uh, there's been reports of that um, uh, uh, eyelet um, fracturing. Living ends long till the end, uh, so if you need to readjust, you can. Uh, create the PI, uh, rotate the knot to prevent hypotony and conjunctival erosion, avoid aero gas in acrius lenses. And remember that these are the patients you are going to follow for a long time. We've been doing a lot of uh, scleral fixated IOLs, I feel like in the last 10 years, but we don't have a super long follow-up on this patient. So we have to see how these patients are doing 30 years out and so. And I really appreciate everybody's time. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen so we can, I think, have a couple more cases.